Welcome to RHI's Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, we are with Dominique Greco, Nighttime Economy Manager for the City of Orlando. Hi, Dominique. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about how women are socializing during the pandemic. Um, would you mind just starting off by telling us a little bit about who you are, what your background is, and where you are based? Alicia, this is great. Um, I'm Dominique Greco. I work for the city of Orlando as the nighttime economy manager, um, and I work for a division or department rather within City Hall, um, the Community Redevelopment Agency, which as you probably know, oftentimes a CRA will sit outside of the city administration, but you know, cross pollinate. We, however, are uniquely positioned right inside, so which is which is, I always kind of say it's a double-edged sword. It's great because lots of access to our transportation department and our planning and our permitting, and you can be very close. Um, but also, you know, we are, a, we are a city government. So we deal with that level of bureaucracy and kind of a big organization. Um, but really the CRA's goal is to develop and redevelop the downtown um, Orlando area, which is our main nightlife and entertainment um, section of the whole city uh also you know in with the international drive which is where kind of the theme parks are centered around and that is another entertainment um and tourism part of town where you know all the tourists stay when they come to the park so mm -hmm. the two are often in competition with one another as you would expect um but downtown's unique because it definitely has a more local kind of feel small business feel I've heard you coined as uh, the nightmare of Orlando. So it seems like there's probably an expectation to be going out quite a bit. So just to give us a little context, um, prior to the pandemic, how often would you say that you were going out and what kinds of environments, what was kind of the norm for you and how has that changed since the start of the pandemic? Before my role with the city and, and into it is to be and just organically very social. And I love, I love my downtown. I live downtown. I my sit, my office is downtown. My old office is downtown. So um, I would say I was out, you know, weekly, sometimes several times, sometimes late, sometimes, you know, early dinner, all of those things, but definitely get a good amount of my work done, you know, right in the downtown core, whether it's meeting someone for coffee or happy hour or, um, late night. And then, of course, as I got into the job, it was very advantageous for me to spend time with our police department and other like regulatory officials. So I would do nighttime details with whoever would have me. I've been out with solid waste, with um, code enforcement, with um, with o with OPD several times. So OPD is def was definitely the most insight, you know, to be out there with the officers who are on the streets nightly and um, be able to see see what, what they see through the public safety lens, because of course, public safety really trumps almost anything else um, when we're talking about change or creative solutions. So A, you know, just spending time with OPD was always smart and uh, we began to understand each other a little better and be able to have more open conversations because oftentimes, you know, the police department is very, focused on their mission, which is to protect the public, which I completely appreciate and understand and respect. Um, but sometimes it probably comes off to other, you know, strategists like myself where, oh, we can't really reach them. We can't really get through to them. They're not on board. So I think um, spending time with them on the streets was was really smart and, and enjoyable and, and also scary. All these different um, kind of nighttime tours that you did probably helped you kind of see nightlife environments and social environments through, we call them sometimes nighttime goggles, you know, that you're seeing things that maybe your average patron wouldn't see. So I'm really interested then, because you do have that extra perspective, that extra lens, extra hat. Um, what has been your experience going out 
during the pandemic, Florida has been um, very unique um, compared to the rest of the country. Um, from my understanding, there was uh, an initial shutdown like the rest of the country uh, shortly after the pandemic um, began, mid-March mm -hmm. 2020. And then I believe it's fairly been open. So, you know, you've had probably more opportunities than a lot of us um, to be able to go out and experience sociability in restaurants and in bar settings. So I would love to hear about what has been your experience going out? Um, what has made you feel safe and comfortable? And how has this, how has this changed, um, you know, since the start up until now? It's been, we're almost at, I think we're at our year anniversary, basically. I'll say that, and you're right, you know, Florida has been unique and continues to be. Um, I'll say my number one word that comes to mind is inconsistent. So, you know, from May, June, up until July, August, and then September, October was weird. And then the holidays, it's been very strange. So normally, like any, like any community, we would know when our busy season is, when our, um, when peak season, you know, when event season is, when, when the college, when colleges are in and like really out, you know, out in, out in big numbers, and then when they're home and they're not out in big numbers. So, usually a an operator, a bar, restaurant, club could really count on that, that ebb and flow that we really knew. And that all went out the window in 2020. So it was like one day, literally day to day, weekend to weekend, it could be completely dead, you know, no, not a lot of people, just crickets. Or next thing you know, the literally the weekend after, you couldn't even prepare for how, how busy it would get. And this went on, like I said, from really June till, till, you know, even now, January, February, March. Um, I do think for myself personally, I have sort of finally relaxed my own quarantine, if you will, um, just in the last couple of months since the new year. And I do feel a level of safe, a more level of safety now with the vaccine, you know, as, as robust as it is, even though it's not, you know, not all the way, but it's, it's definitely, it's a, definitely a start. Um, but also for my mental health, I think uh, I was just, I'm a, I'm a social person. I'm a collab, I'm a collaborator. I'm, I'm a person that likes to bring people together and new ideas and like absent of being on the streets and having happy hour and having dinner with people and seeing my friends and seeing their friends and meeting new people. I was really, it was, you know, it was dark times. Right. And I'm, I'm a single woman. So I was really in, in it myself with just my dog and he's here. So he, he's good. He, 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 he took care of me. It's tough being without, <laughs> without that human contact. So maybe give us a little insight on um, what were you, what was kind of your thought process, you know, personally about what were the biggest barriers that, um, you know, just besides just a general fear of, of becoming infected while being out, what were, what were some of the specifics that prevented you, would you say, from going out more in the past year? Personal fear was, of course, to, I didn't want to get sick. And mostly, not only because I didn't want to get sick, but because my mom had just recently been diagnosed with cancer and she lives about two hours from me. So I have been, you know, doing a lot of driving over the past few months to be, to be there with her, see her for a few days, come back. And so the last thing I would want to do, of course, is to bring the illness into my mom who has cancer's house like that was not even an option so i've been getting i was getting tested pretty regularly i was being very safe very conservative very much inside um and not and so she since she's beaten cancer she's now cancer free she's still recovering but it's it's still it's still rough but thank god she doesn't have cancer anymore and she's also about to get her second vaccine in just uh, next week so that's exciting so that changed everything um and also perception. I mean, I, I would be lying to say that, that that isn't still a thing for me because, you know, personally, I think I have the luxury of being healthy and, um, you know, younger and I am less susceptible to an extent. And I spend the majority of my day not interacting closely with anyone, but even just, you know, 
you just you don't want to get caught at the wrong place at the wrong time and then someone to see you and and so I just haven't even really I haven't been doing any you know after hours or these kind of things that maybe I would once inclined to do don't get me wrong you know nightlife and and entertainment I mean that's that's where we want to be right those are the cool spots but the cool spots have been I don't think right now there are a uh, a home for for much other than just pure riffraff if that makes sense um but also I see it's it's hard to explain because and we are we're Orlando Florida right and so tourism is down so we're really there's a lot of locals to be considering and our local economy or demographic rather um usually is in large part college age students because one of the biggest universities in the in, in the country right right here in Orlando UCF and um what I've noticed is well, let me stay on barriers. So barriers was my personal, you know, my personal reasons, of course, um, first and foremost, the health of my family. And secondly, you know, perception, but what has not been a barrier has been options. I mean, I can still go anywhere at any time at 2 p.m., 2 a.m. It doesn't matter. There's still places that would love to have, you know, me and, and my money and my, my pat patronages, but... <laughs> We're at, we're at this point, we're at the one year anniversary mark. Um, you know, I also find myself, you know, having been very, very cautious this past year, just went out with friends for the very first time in a year doing outdoor dining. So I'm curious for you as, as you're, you know, recognizing that you are, you know, getting to a point where you need to, you know, be able to socialize safely. What are the things that you're going to look for in a business of where you're going to be going out? What check marks need, does that business need to meet for you to feel safe and comfortable to be able to go out again? I, I really notice I've want, I've wanted more space. So I, while six feet distancing is not mandated at a state level or a local level, uh, mostly because we're preempted from doing so, but um, I am looking for places to go where I can sit outside, I can have a good amount of space. And honestly, usually, I've always been the person to like want to bounce around, you know, we want to go from A to B to C to D, no matter what time. Now I am very much so I want to go one place. I want to be there for probably longer than I ever would want to before. And I even like, I want to spend more money. Like when I go out, I actually, I don't want to sit there and just order an appetizer and a drink because I want to do my part for this small business. So I've been very intentional about my, how I spend my money. Um, in, in, not to say I'm not always, but I'd say I'd be more intentional in recent times because I'm thinking about that whole, this waitress, this bartender, this small business, I'm only going to small businesses. I'm only going to places that are local. And if I can help it, I'm only going to places who's, who I know the owners, you know, like I want to support my friends and this community that I love here. And um, thankfully my options are limitless so that it keep it doesn't, it's not hard to do. Women are different, you know, very, I mean, I think it depends on, you know, your life stage, your demographic, what, you, you know, your expectations, your preferences, you know, so I, you know, I'm just really trying to get an understanding of um, for different, for different women personally, what's going to help them feel safe, um, you know, and it also depends on your, your range too of, of, you know, just how risk averse you may be versus, mm -hmm. you know, um, conscious and aware, but, you know, a little bit more open um, to going out. And I think the big thing too is, you know, because I think Florida has gotten a lot of negative press about um, people still patronizing businesses. But I think, you know, that we have to recognize that there is a mental health value to socializing. And also that there are a lot of people like you who want to support their businesses. Um, you know, so what are some examples, um, I mean, about how have businesses gotten creative? to find creative ways right now to either pivot their business model or to help people go that extra mile to help people feel safe? Well, the to-go side of things is still pretty on and popping. Um, lots of really cool ways to package, you know, your product for date night and cross collab. And I love when, I love when my small businesses, you know, cross collab with the florist down the street and the, the cookie maker from this place over here. Um, so, I've seen a few friends and, and restaurants do a really good job at 
putting together like, you know, these pickup all nice and pretty too, you know, like full, full kit and caboodle, just like a picnic basket, almost ready for you, flowers, glasses, you know, so, sometimes so like cool. souvenir. Yeah. So cute. And, you know, even like a mason jar of like a pre-made cocktail or what have you. So I like that. I think the creative has been in the usual ways that you would expect, right? Parklets, creating more outdoor seating, um, uh, that type of thing, but also new concepts. So the thing about Orlando right now is the market is hot, 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 hot. You know, every, as I don't need to tell you, I mean, everybody and their mother is moving to Florida or Texas, I guess. And uh, so with that raising property values, commercial and residential, and we, I've seen personally just a lot of turnover in, um, you know, prop, property owners and also in, in business operators. So Every time a new operator comes in, they are reimagining a concept that's been there, you know, for 10, 15 years. And in this industry, new is usually always good because, and even before COVID, you know, this industry is trend driven. So no matter what, something's only going to be cool and posh and, and sexy for a period of time until we're on to the next thing. So I do like that there's been so much reimagining of, um, you know, what was always like an Irish pub that had been there for 15 years is now going to be like an, a cocktail, you know, Hawaiian themed cocktail lounge. And I, obviously the Instagrammable moments was already cool before COVID, but now, um, you know, just that, that extra level of ex experiential moments when you get to a place, you're not just ordering food at your table, but maybe you're also sitting in this swing and you're, you're taking pictures and there's, um, you know, there, so, so the fun stuff, the fun stuff is still, if not more, you know, more important than ever, because like I said, where I think, well, for me personally, while I'm being very intentional with where I go and how I spend my money, it's still very much less than I ever was before, which is good for me, right? Saving money, but not good for me as a customer because <laughs> I'm, I'm not spending as much. So where I go, uh, I, and like I said, I, I mentioned before, I kind of want to one stop shop. I don't want to bounce around as much. I want to go and sit and relax and do all of those things. So the, the venue needs to offer, they have their work cut out for them. They need good food. I need good beverages. I need good service. I need good pictures. I need good lighting. <laughs> you know? Have you noticed anything different? I know that there's been kind of a push for more sensors, touchless experiences, um, anything else unique going on in Orlando with uh, hospitality restrooms? I did just notice that while most, you know, while everybody was closed during the, during the shutdown and then easing into the opening, um, a lot of people I know took that opportunity to do some maintenance projects, you know, in their, in their restaurants or in their bars and bathrooms has been, uh, has been getting some love. So I've seen some cool wow. bathrooms and I'm going to send you what the thing I was just thinking about. We have like an Instagram blogger here locally and she just follows restrooms. I think retail too. Like if, if I can go to a restaurant, that's also selling plants or soap or ve vegetables. I mean, the other day I was like walking my dog and there was a little pop-up market. I had never, you know, right outside of my building here in downtown Orlando that hadn't really been there before. And it was fresh produce. And I thought that was great. And I was getting my morning coffee, you know, across the street at my place. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get some vegetables from this local vegetable lady that grows vegetables in Orlando. So I think um, retail stands a really good chance to, especially you know, like household things that, cause who's shopping? That's, I was, I can't remember the last time I went shopping to a boutique or to the mall period, end of story. So if I could, you know, if I can be out to dinner, my once, once every other week or however minimal it is hard to say. Um, and also like buy a gift or whatever. That's cool. I like that too. The other thing you mentioned too was kind of that you, um, you know, that you're not necessarily doing that, that bar hopping kind of experience. You know, you're, you tend to be staying in one place and staying there longer. So, and, and, never, and this kind of reinforces this idea that I've read about of this kind of loss of spontaneity oh. in 
the social experience right now where before you could kind of just take a stroll, you'd kind of decide, oh, in the moment where you're going to go. And I'm curious in Orlando, is it is it primarily a reservation based system that you have to really plan ahead or are you still able to kind of pick in the moment um, about where you want to eat and drink? Eating, I would say it's become pretty, pretty heavily uh, reservation because restaurants, you know, in a way, some restaurants have really rose to the occasion and probably doubled down on revenue. I mean, obviously they miss those months and that of course sets you back more than just those couple of months. But since I think I've, I've definitely know some restaurants that have peaked in terms of um, with, you know, with takeout and with now with dine-in, because there was a period of time where we were takeout only, but for drinking, it's a little different. And because again, I'm, I'm talking about our downtown Orlando district, the, the nightlife district. So in the downtown nightlife district, you, you have so many options, which it very much is a bar hop type of city. It's, it's a place that, you know, I would normally go and everyone else that goes down there parks one time, but, but goes to multiple places. I... I feel like a little reckless in doing that. So I haven't really been doing that myself. I, like I said, I've been really sticking to like one spot. Oh, I do like, I definitely do laps a lot recently, like outside, but I'm not necessarily going in and like drinking or whatever, um, standing at the bar. So yeah, restaurants, I think have moved to reservations. The bars are still, they're at a hundred percent capacity. And like some of them choose to do seated service only, but I think it, it's very hard when you have customers beating the door down, which is really what we have, what we've had here in, in moments. Um, I do, I do think that it has been driven by younger people, even more so than usual. And those are the videos that I know that you're seeing that are circulating that are, ah, you know, spring break 2021, except not COVID 2020. Um, and they're just, they don't have the fear at all, right? So they are they are doing what they'd normally do. And uh, that doesn't, I don't feel comfortable doing all of that, even though I definitely once did. Definitely. Well, so I'm curious about whether the demographic that's going out right now has changed at all. You mentioned that, you know, because Florida in general is so tourism driven, um, that it seems to be a bit more of a locals market. So is it still primarily the same age group? Is there anything, you know, different that you've observed or heard about in terms of how women are socializing right now in the downtown district that you mentioned? Based on purely perception, I don't have any numbers. Um, I could, you know, get, get some indicators, like some data indicators, um, you know, later in, if you'd like, but uh, just perception wise, I do think it's been a little bit younger. It's definitely been inconsistent. It's hard to know when it's going to be a busy night versus when it's not. Although case spikes have, have helped, I think a little bit, because when we are seeing a spike, you tend to notice less activity. Um, I would think that not only my opinion, but the, my perception is that people are staying at a place longer. Um, that's something I've heard my friends say as well. And I've noticed, you know, just in when you are sitting at a restaurant, um, people kind of doing the same thing, like really set, setting up shop at their table and keep, keep, keep things flowing, keep the food coming. And like, this is my night out for the week. You know, I really want to maximize um, my time here. So there's some of that. I, are, I, I, should, I should clarify like while tourism international tourism is way down and I can get these numbers too. I don't have them in front of me. Um, domestic tourism is down as well, but not as much, but I, I know cause I do go to the theme parks. So that's interesting that I didn't even add. Um, but at the theme parks, you're in a mask the whole time and you're not confined. They've done a really good job of spacing and social distancing and line queues and queueless queueless lines. Um, so I feel like pretty, I feel very safe at the theme parks. Um, but I bring that up to say that, you know, I go to the theme parks a lot. I'm a big Disney universal person, huge, huge, huge. And usually 
you have a lot of, you know, Brazilian travel groups and even a lot of Asian families. And what I've noticed at the theme parks is none, there's none of that anymore. Now it is New Yorkers, Hasidic Jews, uh, di just different groups of people that normally were very Brazilian, South American tour, tour groups, younger kids, like kids doing tour groups. I'm seeing a lot more locals, couples, um, older couples, younger couples, just more locals, I think, uh, locals, whether they're Florida or New Yorker. I brought up an interesting point about um, theme parks and some of the different procedures that they have. Do you think that any of this might be transferable to business districts that have, you know, large concentrations of bars, restaurants, that social activity? You mentioned um, I think you said touchless or cueless lines or touchless lines or something like that and having masks. What do you think um, could be some lessons learned from theme parks that could be applicable to hospitality business districts? Instantly thought of Universal, for example. Well, Disney too. When you get there, there's an audio component that's going on and it's welcoming you and it's, and it's a cool voice. You know, it's, it's not Mickey Mouse, but it's like, it's a character or it's a Marvel superhero or what have you. And they're like, hey, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, COVID, don't forget, very important. And it's kind of like getting you geared up. And then as you approach, like you, you're not even in the building, you're not even in the park yet. And you have really ample signage, but it's not like, do not, do not, not socially distance. It's not, it's very, it's themed. It's built into the theme. So all of a sudden it goes from feeling like, oh damn, so much rules, oh, so much constraint to, okay, like you're making this easy for us. So I think that downtown districts, I love that audio thing that I just said, because I think that A, it's, it's affordable. It's not a very, it's not a huge investment. Um, and of course, and it would have to be creative. It would have to be cool. And I think it would have to be married with like some, some fun stuff that's like, I don't know. I mean, a mask station where you like pick up your mask and like maybe those masks are different all the time, depending on the day or whatever, or I don't know. I mean, I could get really creative. You know, you think about like your Harry Potter house, you know, which, which Harry Potter house am I? Um, there's, there could be some of that. Also the theme parks have obviously more well they're private property and they obviously have you know more money to to exhaust on these type of things so they have friendly customer service type if it was downtown it would be a mask police you know and like nobody would like this person because it would be just in the way nobody wants to be told but at the theme parks it's like you're just you're on their turf and you're going to do things their way but they're going to do a really good job of making that like fun and effortless for you. So theme parks have advantage, tons of advantage in that way because they can keep people, they can keep people's interests for a longer period of time. So they have more things to do. Uh, even the theme parks are really relying on um, ordering, you know, ahead of time, ordering on your app, and then you are basically picking up and they've set out a lot of more outdoor seating socially distanced. And so, and they still have um, limited capacity on their attendance. So I think that's in those months of being closed, obviously some of the bright minds at Disney and, and or Universal were looking at this big piece of property and figuring out, okay, we usually can have 20,000 people here, but now we can really only have 10. So how do we you know, parse that out and, and spread it out. And I think um, both parks have done a really good job, but with maximizing, you know, their profits, right? They will still want people to be in there, but still keeping, um, keeping the numbers down where they're not just going to capacity. I mean, there was a few weeks in there where they, I think they, they missed the mark. Um, but overall, I think they've been really successful and it's been nice to see um, and then I think that they're both doing their own like internal testing now at this point with their staff, which was tricky at the front end because, you know, people were 
you, you, you could just say that you think you had COVID and then you, then all of a sudden you had COVID, but you didn't really have COVID, but you're still getting paid to work. So it was like constant drama with them from a HR perspective. They had laid people off, they had furloughed people and they were bringing them back. So it's definitely been an art. I, you know, kudos to the theme parks for, for figuring out what they have interesting um, firsthand experience being in Orlando. Um, I want to bring it back to an earlier comment that you mentioned about how previously pre-pandemic we used to be able to kind of predict when there was going to be a high season when you know it was around events it was around you know peak holidays St. Patrick's Day for instance is coming up you know that and Halloween New Year's Eve you know around those kinds of days but now with the pandemic it's a very it's very difficult and I imagine that's hard to be able to um, plan for hospitality businesses to plan when they need to increase their staffing and also for law enforcement and regulatory agencies about when they also need to be increasing kind of monitoring and compliance and that sort of thing. So since you do work with some of these agencies, what, what has been some of the feedback you've gotten um, from them about the challenges they're facing too? Yeah, well, thankfully, I, I do think that my theory on people wanting to be in one place longer has, is not just my, it's not just, you know, me, I think it is a lot of others. So that has built in a level of patience for a customer. And I definitely think like my tolerance of, you know, waiting for things has, I'll wait however long you need me to. Like I am, I am just so patient at this point because again, I'm just so thankful to be out <laughs> and to be sitting at a restaurant that I missed that I haven't sat at in so long that you could keep me there all night and I would probably be fine, you know, as long as long as we're enjoying. It has been hard, especially for your smaller, not, no, not even especially for your smaller, for your smaller and your larger hospitality outlets to have the right amount of staff on. Um, thankfully, people are also eager to work. So sometimes you're short staffed and you can literally get someone else out, you know, to come, come pick up a shift in an instance notice, uh, you know, just really depending on, on your staff and, and all of that. So I think the patience has been built in. Um, yeah. Cause how could you not be right? Like then you're just, you're just, you're not a nice person. <laughs> not. This can be our PSA, you know, in closing, be nice, be nice to other people, yeah. be nice to your servers, be grateful that, you know, we can have these yeah. experiences still in a crazy time. Because When they were coming back to work, you know what, they were getting sick. And then it was then, then nobody, then there was like a few weeks where people didn't want to work, you know, so like I said, back to the inconsistency, it's just been, it's been incredibly inconsistent in in pricing of what you're ordering in getting how much staff is going to be on or willing to be on, you know, how busy your, your bar is going to be or not. And then you, you put the rain on top of it, which we're getting into rainy season now. And so now everybody's outdoor space, you know, as, as some of the colder States have dealt with, it's like, Oh snap. Okay. Finally got outdoor dining down a little bit. And now, Oh crap, we need to uh, mitigate for rain, which, you know, you would, you would think, they would have already thought about, about that, but it was, it was survival mode. It's been survival mode for the whole year, pretty much. And um, I think that again, patience, patience is a virtue now. I think that it's kind of a money where you put your money where your mouth is right now and um, be intentional and, you know, show that support for the place that you want to see there in your neighborhood in six months from now, because let's just assume that even in Florida where, you know, it looks like business may be good. There is a lot of other unforeseen things that, you know, the media is not catching on to that's, that's being shown in California and across the news that they are dealing with, um, including, you know, lobbying for a lot of different types of new regulations and, and all of that. So intentional, um, keep it local, keep it small. Let's, you know, tip, <laughs> tip well, and, uh, and just, you know, social distance, because I think that we've, we've, we've had Florida struggled being with enforcement. So when you talk, you did ask about PD and like code or enforcement rather, like how, do, how are they doing their scheduling? Well, they're doing it the same they always did because it's the same size that it always was. And it's the same frequency that it always was. That hasn't really changed. 
uh, we haven't had the ability to up our enforcement in 95% of the ways that we would have considered had we not been preempted by the state in the ways that we have. So uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's been scary. You know, it's been scary because those, those news clips that you are seeing are real as well. So even though I'm kind of telling you, I feel safe and I feel at bay in a lot of, in a lot of ways, there is of course, always something to be said about 10, 11, 12, 1 AM when, you know, inhibitions go out the window and that's what alcohol does for us. And that's, that's why it, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse for everybody. And um, so it, it gets, it, it does get scary. So thank you so much for doing this interview. I really appreciate it and stay safe out there in Orlando.